Okay, so uh, lecture 13A. Now, I just want to let you know that you should not be looking for lectures 12A, B, C, or D because they do not exist. Lecture 13, module 12 was an exam week, so we're starting uh, week 13 with lecture 13A, all right? And so uh, we're going to be starting with a discussion of Gregor Mendel, who was a uh, some type of monk uh, growing peas in a garden someplace in Europe a long time ago. Uh, but, but what his work does, I mean, you've, you've probably heard the story of Gregor Mendel and his peas. What I want you to think about now is uh, his results in the context of scientific method. And, and so let's talk Mendel and what he saw and what he uh, and how he addressed what he saw, because it's actually a really nice demonstration of scientific thinking. Okay? So Mendel uh, noticed a few things. He was, he was breeding garden peas, um, and he noticed that some peas had purple flowers, and some peas had white flowers. So I mean, so and if you have a kind of Pea. If you have a strain of peas that has white flowers, it always has white flowers. You, you keep, you, it keeps on breeding white flowers after white flowers. You know, generation after generation will be pure white. Similarly, the purple flowered peas will always produce truly purple flowered plants. Right? Now, uh, what Mendel did was he very carefully crossed purple and white. Basically, he took pollen from the purple flowered plants and pollinated white flowered stamens, uh, stigmas with that, right? And you can read the textbook about how they did that. This. And so when he crossed them, uh, the, we call this the F1, the offspring of the purple flowered and the white flowered plants, right? The seeds grew into plants with purple flowers. Now that's not the segregation, that, that's based on the first generation. Segregation occurs in the F2, which is when you take F1 plants and allow them to self-fertilize, or you take F1 plants and make them with other F1 plants. In other words, it's a cross where both parents are F1 to give rise to the F2. In the F2, he saw a segregation of the two traits that he started out with. He found purple flowers, and white flowers, and he found them in a ratio of about three to one, okay? And, and so this is the observation. And you know, this observation of, of Mendel led him to think about, well, how could this uh, be accounted for within the laws of nature, right? And yeah, I, I don't realize, uh, Mendel was a man of the cloth, and yet he was looking for a completely naturalistic, in other words, he wasn't satisfied with saying, well, God must have made it that way. Uh, he was actually looking for a naturalistic explanation for how this would occur. And, and, and so his model, his hypothesis was that, well, um, there must be these things called, I mean, he didn't call them genes, they were just hereditary particles genes which confer, cause, somehow influence flower color in, uh, in determining the, the color of the flowers. There are genes underlying this. These are basically uh, particles of inheritance. Which importantly do not change as a result of having been together with other similar genes. In other words, uh, what he has to explain here is, well, why don't the purple flowered plants and the white flowered plants just kind of meld into lavender flowered plants that continue to have lavender flowers forever and always, right? But his, his model here was the, 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 the heredity was conferred by particles that don't change over time. And moreover, the genes may be either dominant or recessive, such that uh, when you um, 
when you uh, bring them together, when you have uh, the purple flower genes, they call them P, and the white flower genes, call them W, you bring them, to them together, say you've got a P and a W, the plants have purple flowers. In other words, the purple flowers are being, the purple flower genes being expressed. In the, in the individual, in the F1 individual, whereas the white flower gene is not expressed. Okay. And, and the, the not expressed gene is the one that we call the recessive gene, the recessive allele. Right. Whereas the one that is expressed when you've got the two genes together, this is the one that's identified as the dominant allele. I'm inserting modern terminology where uh, none of these words would have meant anything to Gregor Mendel. Um, what his concepts are are completely valid, right? Uh, moreover, you know, we're, we're going to adopt another convention here, which is to say, well, uh, when you've got a dominant allele and a recessive allele, the dominant allele is the one that determines, is, is going to be given uh, the capital letter. The, Recessive allele basically uses the same letter, but it'll be in lowercase, right? And so you can tell that it's lowercase because they put a little tail in front of the P. And so instead of saying that the individual, the F1, is going to be PW, we'd say it's going to be big P, little p, right? Right. So uh, and and so when when you have a big P, little p. In the F1, the uh, the genes that the F1 are going to be passing to their offspring. In other words, when F1 plant passes a gene on to F2, it might be big P or might be little p, and these are going to occur at a ratio of about 50-50, right? So you've got a 50% chance of passing on a big P, 50% chance of passing on a little p, and the same is true for the other F1 parent, right? So 50% chance of passing a big P. 50% chance of passing a little p. And so there's like a 50% chance of getting a big P for one parent and another 50% chance of being a big uh, getting a big P from the other parent. And so that would be 25% chance of getting big P and another big P. You would have a 50% chance of getting a little p from one parent and a big P from the other parent. So there'd be a 25% chance getting um, a little p and a big p, you've got a 25% chance of taking a big p from the first parent and a little p from the second parent, 25%. Big p and then a little p. And you also have a 50% chance of getting a little p from each parent, right? So 25% chance of being a little p, little p. And so what we're saying here is that if this is the case, these three, according to our model, should be either big P, big P, which would be purple flowers in the original state, or big P, little P, or little P, big P. These are, these are basically the same. And, and so these three, would you would expect them to have purple flowers. And the 25% the chance of the offspring of the F2 that happen to get a little p from both parents, these are the ones that can have white flowers, right? And so, so basically, uh, Mendel's model of genes, where he had dominance and recessiveness as characteristics of the genes in terms of how they're expressed when they're, they come together, you know, one dominant and one recessive in the same genotype. This is the model that he used to explain this observation. Okay. See that? Remember back when we were talking about the scientific method, we had something to explain, right? We had something we needed to understand, right? That's the observation. Okay. Uh, Mendel comes up with an explanation or a hypothesis for how that it's going to be explained. And now we can set up experiments because if Mendel's model is correct, we should be able to set up a really large experiment in which we're crossing purple with white 
and get a lot of F1 plants. They should all have purple flowers. It's, it's, it's repeatable you can replicate the experiment. Then you cross the F1s with F1s. You should get a whole bunch of F2 plants and the ratio of purple flower plants and white flower plants in the F2 should be three to one. Okay? In other words, if you can support that with experimentation, then you have support for your model. If you do that experiment and you come up with two to two, an, an equal number of purple and white, then there's something wrong with your model, right? But that, you know, that didn't happen. In the case of Mendel, he got support for his results. And moreover, he was able to replicate it with other kinds of flowers, other kinds of characteristics from his pea plants. And now I go over to our chapter and I give you a nice little picture of our man of the day, Gregor Mendel. And, um, and here's uh, the procedures that he did. He had to carefully um, de uh, emasculate plants and cross them carefully. And he, got, he crossed them and got the, the offspring. But, but here's the results of what I wanted to, to, to share with you. I mean, he looked at not only flower color, he looked at flower position, seed color, seed shape, uh, pod shape, pod color, and the stem length. He basically looked at seven different characteristics. Okay? And he did experiments of this nature with all seven of these characteristics. And what he found was that, you know what? This happens every damn time I do it, right? I started off with round seeds and wrinkle seeds, plants, I crossed them, all the F1 were round, okay? Then when I planted the F1, I got, you know, when I, when I crossed the F1 with other F1, I got a three to one ratio of plants that produce round seeds and plants that produce wrinkled seeds, right? Uh, flower position, I had, had plants that with, with axial flower position, plants with terminal flower position, I crossed them, ended up with plants, they all had axial flower position in the F1, but then when I crossed the F1 with the F1, I got three to one axial to one terminal, right? Three axials to one terminal. In other words, he went through what you would expect a scientist to do to come up with empirical support for his explanation. And he did so not only for the flower color, but for seven other characteristics that he had in his pea plants, okay. which brings us back to this. And, and so um, what Mendel did was he uh, published his results, okay, and uh, these results were pretty amazing, right? Uh, and he basically said, oh, we've got something called a law. I mean, I've, I've demonstrated it so well for my pea plants, I'm gonna go ahead and call it a law. Uh, and the law is dominance. You have to, you're always gonna have one allele that's dominant, one allele that's recessive. And uh, I've demonstrated seven times that, that, that must make it a scientific law, right? Well, you mean, it, 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 this is completely repeatable. You could replicate Mendel's experiments today and you would get basically the same results, right? So there's nothing wrong with Mendel's experimental design, at least not at this point, okay? But we can demonstrate that it's not always gonna be true, right? Uh, later on, we'll talk about this phenomenon called incomplete dominance. Okay. With incomplete dominance, the F1 is kind of halfway in between, is intermediate. between the two parental types. So with snapdragons, you can have a white snapdragon and red snapdragon. You cross red snapdragon with a white snapdragon and you end up with offspring that are pink, right? Okay. Now, what, what this is doing, it's, it's basically telling us that Mendel's law of dominance might not necessarily be a law, but even though it's not, even though we, we don't have it always being true, it's still completely valid. I mean, think of all the things we've learned about uh, as far as um, inheritance takes place. Uh, there's still a great deal of scientific validity of the Mendelian phenomenon of dominance that makes it, that that gives us great insight. So it would be it would be completely uh, uh, foolish for us to discard Mendel's work because we were to find that 
Snapdragon plants do not adhere to the law of dominance. Okay, with me there? Yeah, yeah if you haven't guessed, there's a deeper lesson here, right? Um, scientific uh, advances take place. We learn stuff and we and we don't expect scientific uh, findings to go without exception, right? In this case, Mendel found something that was really significant about the rules of inheritance. And sure, exceptions are going to be found, but, but that doesn't take away from what we learn about the fundamental things we learn about inheritance uh, from the original study, okay? Now, uh, let's uh, review some of our terms and get back to this concept of a Punnett square. What I did for you before with a lot of words is done really easily with Punnett squares, okay? Uh, Punnett squares were recognizing two different alleles. In this case, the two alleles were the two different forms of the gene. And the, for flower color, it would be the big P allele and the little p allele, right? We also recognized three genotypes, three gene combinations you could have with the two genes they're getting from the two parents. The genotypes are big P, big P, big P, little p, which is the same as little p, big p. We're putting those two together. And little p, little p. Okay. And, and so with two alleles, we're always going to have three genotypes. Okay. Now, uh, what we're saying with a Punnett square is that we can do that cross. Basically, we know that if we have the original cross, the two parental types, parental genotypes are, are big P, big P, this is our purple flowered P plant parents, say that five times really fast, and our white flowered P plant parents, right? Uh, little P, little P would be their genotype. Those are the parental types, okay? Um, they would cross to give rise to the F1, and the F1 would be big P, little p, right? Now, if you have two alleles, two of the same alleles, Two, two alleles that are the same, we say we're homo, meaning the same, zygous. Never mind why we say zygous, that's just what we say, okay? So homozygous means we've got two of the same alleles. And so you'd say both parental types are homozygous. And we get to the F1, we've got one big P and one little p. The two genes are different, and we'd say these are heterozygous. And, uh, and homozygous is the adjective that's used to describe the genotypes we'd call the actual individuals that are homozygous in their genotypes would say they're homozygotes. Uh, this case makes a little bit more sense because we're producing all of the same type of zygotes, right? Heterozygous, means we're going to be producing different zygotes, but, but hetero means different, homo means the same, okay? Now, when you set up um, the expectations for the F2, we get those from a Punnett square. Use a Punnett square. Right, in your book, tells you how to set this up. You would swallow for a Punnett square of big P, little p, crossed with big P, little p. You would say, well, you know, what, what you have to do is this concept that I call a, uh, a virtual meiosis. Where did I have it here, right? Uh, I thought I had this here someplace. And yeah, maybe I, I got rid of it. Okay, so uh, for a Punnett square, undergo this uh, virtual meiosis and say, well, if this is my genotype, if big P, little p is my genotype, what are the gametes going to look like? Okay. Well, it's going to have 50% gametes. 
with big P and 50% gametes with little p, right? And that's going to be the same for both parents, 50-50, big P, little p, 50-50, big P, little p. And so when you set Punnett square, you're going to say, well, these are the two kinds of gametes that are produced by one parent, the big P and the little p. And these are the two kinds of gametes that are produced by the other parent, big P and little p. And when you produce those gametes and let them cross, you, this, this, will, this cell up here would be your 25% your ch your chance of getting a big P from both parents. It'll be big P homozygote. Now here you would have big P and little p. Remember, we're not distinguishing between little p, big P and big P little p. So these would both be heterozygotes and the little p, little p homozygote would be down here in the lower left. And so we're looking at this, we say there's a 25% chance, 25% chance, 25% chance, and 25% chance. Each one of these squares within the Punnett square is represented by a 25% chance of getting them. They would notice that this one plus this one plus this one would give us a 75% chance of being purple flowered because both big P, big P and big P, little P have purple flowers. And a 25% chance of having white flowers. Okay. So that is, um, well, this is how we end up with the three to one ratio. Three to one is kind of like a golden number, a golden ratio when it comes to your expectations for genetic crosses. Okay, so we've covered everything here, two genotypes, dominant recessive alleles, we talked about that. But we also, yeah, you know, this is actually an important point for us. Okay, so um, we've talked about how the big P allele is dominant the dominant allele because it is expressed in the heterozygote, right? When, when you have big P, little p, the big P allele, the one that confers purple flowers is the one that gets expressed. Okay? The recessive allele, allele is the other one. Now, we also talk about dominant and recessive traits, right? I guess the distinction here is between traits and alleles. Alleles are the kinds of the genes. The traits refer to the purple and white, right? You'd say purple is the dominant trait because it's the one that is expressed in the heterozygote, right? So again, point here, it's something that is potentially confusing, so it's worth your while to pay attention here is that dominant and recessive are adjectives that can apply both to the alleles, to genes, to kinds of genes, as well as to the actual traits. The traits, dominant recessive traits, those are the ones that are going to be appearing in the three to one ratio, right? The dominant recessive alleles are there actually in equal abundance, right? You have a total of four dominant alleles and a total of four recessive alleles in the Punnett square, right? And so when you, when you talk about the three to one, three to one ratio, uh, the three is going to be the dominant trait. The one is going to be the recessive trait. Okay. Back to our chapter. Which is to say that, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, remember I said that Mendel was replicating this result for all seven of his characteristics. Um, Another thing that he uh, did, and this is one that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of skipping over a couple of sections of the chapter, to, is to look at both um, you know, two traits at the same time. Okay? And so in uh, chapter nine, section five, the illustration that they go to, uh, the illustration that they, they have, is one which you're looking at seed color and seed uh, smoothness or seed shape at the same time. Okay. 
And what, um, what, what Mendel said was that if you have, let's see, yeah, I need to have annotation. If you have big R, little r, big Y, little y in the um, in the F1, F1 is going to be big R, little r, big Y, little y, which is what you would have, right? That's what we have here. If the F1 is that, right? I forgot the one there. Then the gametes produced are going to be 25%. Big R, big Y, 25%. Big R, little y, 25%. Little R, big Y, and 25%. Little R, little y. In other words, it's, it's not like big R and big Y go together. Okay. Do they do they go together or do they go independently? No, they don't go together. They go independently. And that's why you're you're just as likely to have little a big R paired with big Y as you are big R paired with little Y. In other words, you have an equal likelihood of getting both of these. You're equally likely to have little r go with big Y as it is with little y. You've got an equal likelihood of both of those. And similarly, big Y is going to go equally likely with big R and little r. Little y is going to be, go equally likely with big R and little r. And so the, the, the fact that they don't go together, they go independently, is the thing that we call the law of independent assortment. And, and what you end up with is that, well, we're basically getting a three to one ratio of round to wrinkled. Okay. We're getting a three to one ratio of yellow to green. Okay. See that in the results here? Okay. Um, but they're superimposed with each other. Of the of the round seeds, three of them are going to be yellow, and three of them are going to be green. Or right, so one of it is going to be green. Okay? If you look at the green seeds, three are going to be smooth, one is going to be wrinkled. Right? And so basically, you know, what we're we're seeing with by setting up this dye hybrid cross, we've got two alleles going at the same time, is a demonstration of Mendel's law of independent assortment, right? Okay, um, I want to point out that this thing here is actually a Punnett square, okay? Uh, it, it is, it, it, this would be a four by four Punnett square in which we're looking at the different genes, gene combinations carried by the gametes. We'll have 25% of those, 25% of those, 25% of those, 25% of those in, in both parents. And so what we're saying is we've got a 1 16th of a chance of getting each of these combinations that are listed in the Punnett square. And that's how we end up with the 9 16th yellow round combination of traits, 3 16th green and round combination of traits, 3 16th yellow and wrinkled combination, 1 16th green and wrinkled. In other words, uh, for a dihybrid cross, nine to three to three to one is the ratio that we find in your standard dihybrid cross. Okay. Go back to this is kind of important. You, I, what, I, what I just did here was to talk. You threw a dihybrid cross with a four by four Punnett square. 
that, that's the one that gave us the nine to three to three to one ratio. Um, and I just used it to illustrate Mendel's law of independent assortment. Our round seeds are gonna go equally likely with yellow seeds and uh, green seeds and wrinkled seeds are equally likely to go with yellow seeds or green seeds, et cetera, right? Okay. Uh, Mendel called it a law, but you can actually show that um, if it were, yeah, if it were true that the round genes on the same chromosome as the yellow genes, right? So this might be the uh, chromosome that came from uh, one plant, and this might be the chromosome that came from the other plant, little r and little y, right? If, if they were on the same chromosome, Think about it, okay. Would you actually get big R together with little y? Would you actually get little r together with big y? Would you get, um, I mean, would you get these weird combinations, okay? These are combinations that, yeah, well, yeah, they can occur, combos, but they must, uh, have some a crossover somewhere between the two between the two uh, locations on the chromosome. I mean, if you have a crossover, then you would be getting a big R connected with a little y and a little r connected with big y, big y. But if you don't have that crossover, you only get You only get big R together with big Y and little r together with little y. Okay? So in other words, what we're saying here is that um, you can quickly demonstrate that Mendel's law of independent assortment does not work a lot of the times, specifically if the two characteristics were on the same chromosome. Okay. Um, and so it's you know, basically, you know, not a law. Okay. Although it does, in fact, give us a lot of information. It's another one of those examples where you look at the results and you say, well, we're learning something from this. It might not qualify as a law, but um, what we learned from Mendel's work about independent assortment for genes that are in different chromosomes uh, gave us a great deal of information and we are ever so thankful to Gregor Mendel for having done that. Okay, now here's a little uh, historical trivia for you, right? Kind of like this, I mean, if you go back to Mendel's experiment okay? and think about what he actually did, right? Uh, he came up with seven studies of flower color, flower position, seed color, all these characteristics demonstrated the law of dominance. All, the, all of them demonstrated the law of independent assortment. In other words, he got nine to three to three, one, three to one ratios every time he crossed a combination of axial green, terminal yellow, okay? I mean, when he did these combinations, he always got a nine to three to three to one ratio, okay? But, um, and here's what historians are always going to be arguing about when it came to Mendel, right? Um, he chose seven traits, okay, which, which happened to be on seven different chromosomes. Okay. The, the P genome has seven different chromosomes. It's, it's dip point number is 14, but there are seven chromosomes on the, uh, in, the, in the P genome. He happened to choose one trait to study from each of the seven chromosomes, right? What's the likelihood of that, right? I mean, if you were to randomly pick traits 
from a P, seven of them, what's the likelihood that you would happen to get one from each of the chromosomes that are there? Pretty unlikely, right? So um, you know, there are some historians and scientists who insist that Mendel's experiment was kind of loaded uh, with pre-selected results because he needed to get results that demonstrated his law of independent assortment. And therefore, the other traits that he might have studied, the ones that did not match up with his results, he kind of discarded those results and, and chose to report only the ones that, that provided support for his model of dominance and independent assortment. Some would ascribe that to divine guidance. After all, he was a man of the cloth. Okay. Uh, was it divine guidance or was it shifty scientific uh, behavior on Mendel's part? We'll never know. <laughs>